This episode of Warp 5 is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join in on the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode or any other, please join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel, that's B-A-B-E-L, into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. Hi, this is Tucker Smallwood from Star Trek Enterprise. You're listening to Trek FM. Welcome, Boomers, to another episode of Warp 5. I'm your host, Brandon Shamutella, and I've got a special episode for you today. I'm flying solo, and the episode is going to have a bunch of special little interviews that I conducted at the 2018 convention in Vulcan, Alberta, Canada, called Vulcon. And we've got a few different people, uh, a few different interviews that are going to happen. Uh, two interviews are uh, with Paul Carreau. And I will introduce that first interview with him. And Paul Caro is a part of the Klingon Way. And he's going to talk a little bit about being in the Klingon Way. And he's also going to talk about his project that he's working on and this, this thing that he's trying to launch off the ground to try and get a bird of prey as the second starship at Vulcan, Alberta. Because at Vulcan, Alberta right now, this town was called Vulcan. It's been called Vulcan for a hundred years. But in the 90s, they they decided to try and uh, brand it with Star Trek based on their name. And they they got a Starship Enterprise-looking starship that they have outside of their town, right on the highway. So as people drive by, they can stop and take pictures. They've got a... They've got a uh, the town... Uh, visitor center is shaped like a ufo and it's all space themed and you can walk around the town and there's star trek stuff everywhere so paul caro is going to be talking about his mission to try and get another starship in town and how he wants it to be the bird of prey but he's also going to talk about klingon fandom so i hope you enjoy this first little part of our vulcan 2018 vulcan coverage we're at the Vulcan convention. We just finished the wonderful pancake breakfast, and I'm sitting with Paul Carew. And Paul is a man with a mission that we wish him great kapla. Paul, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are before we talk about what is the project is you're working on. Okay. Uh, my, my CVs. Okay. Um, I have 25 years pensionable service with the Canadian Armed Forces, which means that I'm retired. Um... I've been a Star Trek fan since it first aired when I was 14 years old. I'm 65 now, so uh, we're talking almost 50 years. <laughs> you know, I figure it's pretty cool. My father told me I was an idiot for watching Star Trek, uh, but now he's watching it, and it's kind of fun because he's at the original series. Oh, and he's 90 years old, so I think that's pretty cool. Um, started, got involved with uh, Klingon fandom back in uh, 95. And the reason I got involved in fandom was I was going through a divorce and I had a choice, either go to the mess in the military or keep myself sober and out of trouble. And I chose the latter. Good uh, choice. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, oh, I can honestly say that from my 25 years in the military, I may know five people that I've, that I've worked with over the years. And I can't count the number of people that I know and I'm actively involved with, with the uh, science fiction community. Yeah. You know, I can go anywhere in, in North America. In fact, I can go anywhere in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to find somebody that's a science fiction fan who knows me at least by reputation, which mm -hmm. I think is pretty cool. Yes, yes. And you're on Twitter. What's your Twitter handle? My Twitter handle is Keliv, Q-E-L-I-V. Q-E-L-I-V. A uh, side note, um, my, my Klingon name is Keliv. And when I chose the name, uh, they said, like, pick a Klingon name. And I'm trying to think of myself, okay, it's got to be, 
you know, there's got to be that, that, that consonant. And I, I discovered that Kelib was actually Klingon for Doctor Who. So I thought, okay. Uh, and, and I've actually had conversations with people that uh, speak Klingon. Yeah, yeah. You know, I say, what's your name? I say, Kelib. Doctor of what? No, Doctor Who. <laughs> yes. Awesome. Now, the mission that you're on right now, so in the town of Vulcan, which is where we are, we're here for mm-hmm. Vulcan 2018, and a, a, on the main highway of Vulcan, there is a Constitution-class starship right there, um, and it's a tourist draw. We've got a tourist station in town here that's kind of like a UFO. You go in, there's lots of Trek memorabilia. You go through town. You know, the street lights are shaped like little enterprises. We've got a nice painting of... The, all the doctors on the side of a building, and a few other things here and there. The street walks, the, the crosswalks even, have got the Federation symbol, uh, the Federation Delta in them. And you are on a mission to try and add something else to the town. So why don't you tell everybody what it is you want to add? Okay, we had a project last year called the Klingon Way. Mm-hmm. And the Klingon Way was uh, uh, an initiative that we wanted to change the name of uh, Service Road. That was what it was called, Service Road to the Klingon Way. And we accomplished that. We were, and we had a lot of obstacles because the street was actually under provincial jurisdiction in the town of Vulcan. Uh, the businesses were saying, oh, we can't do that because it's going to cost us money to change stationery. And there were a whole lot of negatives as to why we couldn't do it. Uh, the day that the convention started was when they unveiled that they'd actually renamed the street. So it was a success. So uh, I got looking at this and thinking to myself, hmm, okay, there's a starship there. And, the Klingons have been supporting this town since 1994 when they first started their conventions. And we've been a presence in the town. Like, you know, we've, I've brought Klingons in from across Canada, from Halifax, Nova Scotia. We had a Klingon come up from uh, uh, Florida. Uh, the, the founder of the Klingon Club comes up from Los Angeles. So it kind of, you know, we, we felt left out. We felt like we were not really wanted. You know, we felt that uh, you know maybe maybe you know they're tolerating us, and Klingons don't like being tolerated. I mean, they're a very aggressive <laughs> race, right? So we approached the uh, uh, Trek coordinator, uh, Grant Shaw, and uh, said, "What do you think?" So Grant said, "Yeah, that sounds like an idea." And like any idea, it's where does it go from there, right? So we've been pushing. We've been talking with the. Um, with with the town councilors, we've had a, we had a meeting uh, about a month ago, and land was actually um, committed mm-hmm. for the construction of the project. I talked to the artist who did the uh, the, the constellation class starship, and we got him on board. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, pre- I approached Rick Sternback, who wrote the uh, Bird of Prey uh, workshop manual. And Rick has agreed to come on as a uh, consultant, and uh, he's indicated that he uh, he can open up the ILM files with regards to the bird of prey. So I mean, like, we have a lot of resources at, mm-hmm. at our fingertips. So uh, the goal is to get another another starship here, but a bird of prey starship. Yeah, bird of prey starship. A, I mean, instead of an Enterprise class ship. Yeah, yeah. And, and and what I'm saying is, I mean, like, as, as I said, it started out as an idea. Mm-hmm. Well, the idea is starting to take shape, and I mean, the, the people that are getting on board before we do the building, we've got. Uh, resources in place to actually make it happen. Mm-hmm. Now, to make this viable, we're, um, we have to prove to the province and to the town that this will bring in tourism for the uh, for the city of Vulcan. And we've started an online petition, and to date, is, I understand we have a signature as far away as Kazakhstan. So oh, wow. we're, 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 we're definitely getting out there, and uh, right now it's the art of promotion. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was very fortunate to get... Uh, uh, endorsements from the guest stars that were here this weekend: uh, uh, Jennifer Gotti, um, Rika Sharma, and uh, Tucker Smallwood. All more than happy to uh, to give us an endorsement, and that'll be going up on our webpage within the next week or yep. over the next three or four weeks. Uh, you know. Where can people find the <coughs> petition to sign? The petition to sign is on a, a Facebook page, mm-hmm. the Klingon Way. Mm-hmm. Makes sense, and. Uh, uh, one of the things that surprised me uh, about two weeks ago, we got a, uh, a letter from the mayor of Timmins, Ontario, okay. endorsing the project. Nice. So, yeah, it's it's reaching out. We're getting attention. Mm-hmm. Right on. Now, I want to ask you a little bit as well about this Klingon culture that you're involved in and Klingon fandom. You know, because because Klingons have such a impact on Star Trek fandom, and it seems like as an alien species, and as far as alien species go in Star Trek, they're the majority of people that'd be their favorite alien species would you agree with that yeah i've heard i've heard people refer to uh 
Klingons as the uh, the bikers of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are a lot of leather, yeah. right? A lot of leather, so yeah. that would be, be an apt description. Yeah. Um, when I was in Halifax, I, I worked with a, with a great group of people, put mm-hmm. together a, a, a group of people. And uh, for a lot of the Klingon fans in different parts of North America and probably other places, they don't really get why we were face painting. We, we, we decided we would embark on, on face painting. So you get Klingons in costume, painting little kids' faces. And... Uh, the Klingons, whether they're face painting or whatever the activity, really get involved in community activities, supporting charities, and they, they do it in different ways. We I found that the face painting was uh, a way to keep the Klingons engaged, mm-hmm. and it, it was enthousi- it, basically to, to do the enthusiasm. And from where we came from in Halifax, at that time there was only one convention locally. Mm-hmm. So my challenge was to keep people um, interested in getting into their costumes without actually having an event. Mm-hmm. So we get a purpose put them in a costume get them out in the community get them face painting and uh, uh, one year uh, we actually earned a corporate uh, uh, plaque because we raised over $12,000 for the Children's Earth Foundation face painting and mm-hmm. I mean like consider that's average $3 a face wow that's not bad that's a lot of face painting that's, that's 4,000 face, face paints. Paints. yeah <laughs> yeah crazy so, so how did this start? So you, you mentioned that your founder is in California, yeah. and he's up here for the convention as well. So yeah. how did this group that you're involved with begin? Uh, I think it was just a case that, uh, I think the, the, the person's name is John Alverson. And John just decided he was going to get dressed up as a Klingon and go to a convention. And somebody thought that was a great idea. And it snowballed. And I can, I can I, I actually understand that because my introduction to the fandom uh, I was at a Star Trek premiere, and it was what, 93, 94, I can't remember which. But I was <laughs> I was standing at the urinal, and this guy came up next to me dressed in a Klingon costume, original <laughs> series. And I looked at him, I thought, my God, that's pretty bold. I mean, like, you know, walking around in a, in a, in a, in a Klingon costume. And I, I looked at him, I said, are you a Klingon? I mean, like, it was a question, but it was a statement. Like, you know, are you a Klingon? Yes. And he said yes, and he shoved an application at me, right? And uh, I was going through some difficult times, and I, I put it in my pocket. And I think it took me six months looking at it, you know, thinking like, do I really want to get involved with a, you know, a bunch of pimply faced kids to like stale twenty five year old Star Trek jokes? And yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, it's 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 been a lot of fun. I've made a lot of friends. Uh, I've met a lot of people. Um, uh, my 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 late wife. I met her. I actually, let her, literally met her at a science fiction convention. I was uh, escorting Robin Curtis in, mm-hmm. uh, in Halifax. I was her guest liaison. And this girl came up dressed in a Robin costume, and she had a camera. And I said, "Please take my picture." At that time, they didn't do photos with the guest stars. I mean, you mm-hmm. you bought a picture with a signature on it, and that was basically it. So I wanted some some proof that I'd been with Robin Curtis as a, as guest liaison. And uh, she took my picture, and well, three months later, we we met up at a coffee shop, and she gave me a print. And three years later, I married her. <laughs> Excellent, right on. And you, you were telling me earlier, you guys were very much in a fandom together. And oh went yeah, to a lot of conventions. And stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, well, that was uh, that was an interesting thing. When 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 I started, you know, because of my organizational skills, I came to the attention of the club, and I started to uh, get promoted. And I got promoted pretty quick. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I became a squadron commander for for, for, uh, for for Nova Scotia, Sue came to me and she said, "You cannot promote me." And I said, why not? And she said, because anything you do will be perceived as being nep- nepotism, favoritism. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I won't take a promotion. So she maintained her rank while she was alive. Mm-hmm. And and it was simply because she didn't want anybody accusing me of, you know, favoring her. Mm-hmm. Um, but the reality was we both ran the club. I mean, like, it wasn't just... I, 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 I carried the... the, 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 uh, the credibility I guess the, uh, I was given basically I was it was Paul that was running the club but in reality it was uh, Paul and Sue that ran the club and, and, uh, and actually it worked out because as I was going up in the in the rank structure I realized that I was becoming untouchable people were afraid to, to talk to me so Sue was my back door they would if they had a bitch or a complaint they would talk to Sue mm-hmm. Sue would come to me we'd make the change or, or, or deal with the situation so that in that sense it really worked out well mm-hmm. now at the uh, costume pr- uh, contest that we had here. Yeah. There was actually a rank ceremony that was going on. Did you? Were you there to witness it? At yeah. the they they gave a woman uh, a, a sash. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us about the ceremony and what is involved in this. Um, 
to be honest with you, I I, I didn't do the sash. I mean, like uh, when, when I was bringing my club up, they did the sash. But promotions and that are very important. Um, uh, from my military experience, um, uh, I believe recognition is important. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, and I told my people, you know, constantly, recognition is something that babies cry for and grown men die for. Mm -hmm. I mean, a baby can't talk, but they're hungry, they cry. When they want attention, like a hug, they cry. If they soil their diapers, they cry. Mm -hmm. But that's their way of getting attention. And the grown men die for, you get into a, a, a war situation. The, the the more medals it, it would make a person uh, the guy more attractive to the to the woman Jim, back Jim. home you know like he's a hero mm -hmm. so uh, Jim. Jim. I did everything I could Jim. we did uh, certificates we did uh, rank we did honorifics um, as an aside one of the things that really sticks out I had a a, a, a lady that uh, uh, was very instrumental in helping us build our club she was a single mom and. Uh, she had a, a friend of hers that was a, was like a living babysitter, and they, you know she'd look after the kids when, when, when uh, Dee would come out to the to the events. And we did a potluck, and and potlucks were important. That's how I did my my promotions and my recognition and stuff. And I recognized the babysitter. I had a certificate all done up, you know, Klingon, you know, mm -hmm. basically recognizing the babysitter for making it possible for Dee to uh, come out to the um, out to the event, and. I gave her the certificate, and I and I thanked her for uh, you know the the contribution she was making behind the scenes, and she started to cry, and I'm like, what did I say? I mean, like you know, it blew me away. Like this, this woman's crying, but nobody had ever thanked her for anything. Okay. Yeah. Nobody had ever singled her out for you know for like you did something really special, mm -hmm. and I knew it was important, but I didn't realize just how powerful it was. It was a lesson for me mm -hmm. as a, as a leader to make sure that. You know, uh, you recognize, but even if it's small, you recognize it because it it makes a person feel good about themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, another story with recognition. Uh, we were in Sydney, and I had this guy, like we are in costume, and, and the whole lot of stories come out of that. And this guy came up to me, and he's a new guy, and somebody had asked him if he was part of a movie on, in, in Sydney. We're from Halifax, and Sydney's about a six-hour drive from Halifax. And somebody asked if he, that there was a, a, a movie being shot and if he was part of the movie. And he came up to me later on, he says, you know, he said, uh, and he's a young guy, he said, I was at a point where I was deciding whether I was going to start doing break and enters or get involved in something, he said, and I'm really glad I got involved in this. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, it's it's the positive recognition, it's mm -hmm. powerful. The fandom is important, and you yeah. know, the fandom has a community, yeah. and it makes people feel involved, yeah. and you know, like, as a youth, I was kind of ostracized for my fandom, and I didn't know a lot of people, but once I found that community... <coughs> you know, it definitely was there, and it was definitely very, very, very helpful. So. I got news for you, Brandon. You and me <laughs> both on that one. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. So you've been involved a lot. You've you, you've spearheaded this project. You're you're trying to bring this this clay on bird of prey to the town of Vulcan. Yeah. Okay. So the goal for this is to bring more tourists, to bring more attention to Vulcan, Alberta. You've got celebrities that are backing it. You've got people that are involved. Uh, what is your ultimate goal of completion? When do you want to have this done for? It, you know. When would you like to see this happen? When we started this, uh, I, I looked at a timeline, realistically, about three years. Mm -hmm. I think we're probably ahead of the curve with what we've been able to accomplish. Okay. And uh, I'd like to do a special shout-out. Like, it's not just my initiative. I have a guy that's in Timmins, Ontario, who is a member of the Klingon Club. And his name is Peter Hutchinson, and I'm hoping he hears this because, Peter, well, it can't happen without you. You're, mm -hmm. you're very integral to this. Um, and, 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 again, stories. Uh, there was a town council member in, its, in the town of Timmins that basically went public and put the idea of a, of a fan, like a, like a Comic Con down. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what the exact title was. So Peter organized his people. They went to the town council in Klingon costume and basically pr presented their case to the town council. Okay, move forward about a year. The town of Timmins raised the Klingon flag outside of the town hall, and they've done it two years in a row. And the, the mayor of Timmins has sent us a letter uh, to the Klingon way page, basically supporting our, our initiative. So uh, it's not just me. I mean, I appreciate the fact that people say, oh, yeah, it's Paul. No, I'm, in, I'm closer to Vulcan, but there's a lot of people helping us outside of Vulcan, uh, and I think their efforts are equally as important as what we're doing here. Excellent, right on. Well, tell everybody again where they can go to sign the petition and where they can find you on Twitter. Well, the petition's online, and there is a link at the Klingon Way. Most postings that we do, we provide the link, so just basically click the link and, and go to the online p uh, petition. 
And if not, uh, send us an email with your name, and we'll add that to the petition as well. And the email is is with the Klingon way. There's a problem. You can me- you can message us through there as well. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Right on. And you're on Twitter at my my, my handle is Kelliv Q E L I V Q E L I V. Excellent. At at, at Kelliv. Yeah, that's okay. that's my Twitter, and uh, it's linked to the Klingon way page. So anything I post to the Klingon way page will be picked up on Twitter. Excellent. So everybody, tag him, say hello, give him a cup lot. Don't tell him he's a wet targ. He's a good guy. <laughs> So thank you so much for sitting down and talking to me, Paul. I really appreciate it. And I uh, I can't wait to see this bird of prey because it's going to happen, right? It is. It yes. Is. Awesome. Thank you, Brandon. Here we are again with Paul Caro and Pat Weisner, special guest as well today. And we're still at the Vulcan Convention, uh, Vulcan, Alberta, 2018. And we're sitting down with uh, Pat because we want to ask some questions about how Vulcan came to be associated with Star Trek and the, the history behind incorporating Trek fandom into your town. Well, um, back in the actually early 90s, Mm -hmm. a group of people got together. There was a government program called... The Tourism Action Plan. No, before that. Before No, it was... Okay, well, in 88, I was in Irma, and I was the chairman of the Tourism Action Plan. But we didn't have a Tourism Action Plan here. We had another rural thing. It was Rural Roots or something like that. And so it uh, promoted people to get together... And talk about their communities and how they could build their communities okay. to keep them vibrant and strong. So we all got together and came up with the idea of uh, Star Trek. Previous to that, we the town wanted a new sign at the entrance. So they created this Vulcan concrete nothing sign. And uh, so we, once we started talking about it, people come and said, that's great, we've been driving by Vulcan for years. We'd stop and take our picture beside the Vulcan sign. We thought, okay, this is really good because now I think we're into some kind of a groove here. So everything we've done is always attracted the Star Trek fans, fandom, and it's been actually pretty amazing. The, the support we've received from the fans and the people that come by has been astounding. Mm-hmm. See, we have in Regina, Saskatchewan, we have a town called Hitchcock, and I'm a big Alfred Hitchcock fan. Okay. And my wife and I, we missed a turn on our trip a couple weeks ago, and I, I vaguely remember that there was a town. And we, we pulled in, and there's nothing in Hitchcock except a green sign, because in Saskatchewan, our, our yeah. direction signs are all green. It just says Hitchcock, and I'm like, I have to stop and take a picture <laughs> by the sign. It's just a sign, yeah. right? It, there's nothing there. Hitchcock, no services, yeah. right? So if you have people by Vulcan, like as a Star Trek fan, I would have definitely yeah, stopped at a sign that said Vulcan, and yeah. then you took it a step beyond. We formed a group uh, called Vast, mm-hmm. and Vast we created all. We started our first convention with the help of Trek fans because one of our members was a Trek Grace. She would go all over the country to Star Trek conventions. I didn't know that, but so she started bringing people in and telling us, "Well, this and the." So we learned a lot, and then we had others come in and say, well, this is what we expect at a convention. So we did that. <clears throat> so then we got thinking, well, you know, if we had a, a, a hook or a, a, something more than just a concrete sign on the side of the road, maybe people would actually stop for a little while. So we commissioned the building of the spaceship, mm-hmm. and we called it the 1995A uh, because we didn't want to be too much infringing on the mm-hmm. stuff. Because we thought, well, we're Vulcan. We should be able to do whatever Vulcan wants to do. Not thinking about trademarks and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> so we kept pushing and thought, well, you know, people are stopping. They're taking pictures. Put the sign up. I put the labels around the bottom of it in the granite. I was like, you know, if we had a facility that people could actually come into... Then the people here would realize we are a destination and people will come here to see that stop in the station. It can't just be a regular building. It has to be something out of this world. Mm -hmm. So Grace and I got together with an engineer and an architect in the city. We drew up uh, original plans and we presented them to the town. The town said, well, you know, there's not really much tourism going on here. And uh, I secured the property with a handshake for one year, and they said, ah, no one's going to buy that. So I said, well, okay, after a year, I let it go. Mm-hmm. The next week, there was a development permit on the town of Vulcan's desk to develop the 
hamburger place there. Mm -hmm. And they went, well, this is, like, nothing turns in this town that fast. Mm -hmm. So, they said, well, then they come back, well, where can we build, like, we're, we're going to do this ship thing, so where are we going to build it, like, this station? Well, I said, you've lost your prime little opportunity here. If you build next to it, I guess that's the next best. Well, that land costs really expensive. I said, well, you're going to lose a lot. They were donated some land across the street. I said, no, you don't want that. Mm -hmm. You want to be beside your ship. Well, that's how common it is where it is now. Mm -hmm. They built the station. They didn't build the one we had designed, but they built the station. Mm -hmm. eh, it's been working pretty good. What was your role with the town at this time when you were trying to instigate these things? Just on the group of vast. What is so vast? What is vast? Vulcan Association for Science and Trek. Okay. Mm -hmm. And through that group, we had conventions. Uh, we started off really small. We go to the town and ask them for a thousand bucks just to float us through the convention. Mm -hmm. And we put on conventions for a couple of grand every time. It was. We didn't have big stars. We had authors. We had just special guests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Trek fans keep coming down, and so as it's grown, we've got more and a bigger budget. And um, so our emphasis was to get it up and running and then turn it over to tourism or some other organization that could actually fund the thing and make it really go. Mm -hmm. So we carried it for a number of years. When we built the station, Vast had one of the pods because people would come here and want to donate all of their collection memorabilia. And we needed a place to put it, to display it, so others could come and see it. Mm -hmm. And um, that's so... There's three pods on the station, and one was for vast. The other one was more for storage, and the other one was they started off using it as a chamber of commerce and economic development office, which we thought, you know, that's not a bad combination. It's all changed since then, but that's how we started it off. Mm -hmm. uh, I created some uh, coins, created postcards. What else did we do? There's a bunch of stuff we did over the years, mm -hmm. and uh, that's how it's grown. We finally turned it into a tourism society now, and I've been away from it for a couple of years. Uh, I didn't get my chair renewed, so mm -hmm. I finally got to step back after 25 years of working it. It's funny when you get into something like that, you just put your head down and keep pushing, push, 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 and you look up at a convention and you go, Wow, there's a bunch of people that really want to be here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. And uh, so the excitement has continued on. And then when I stepped back, I realized I kind of missed a lot of my family stuff. So it was like, okay, it's time to let somebody else step in. Well, the enthusiasm isn't quite as acute mm -hmm. as it was when we started because mm -hmm. we all had a mission, we had a goal, and we still have a goal, and we're still working on our goals. Mm -hmm. But the group that's in now is more uh, what's the word you'd say, Paul? Uh, bean counters. <laughs> yeah. More um, administrative than mm -hmm. actually getting down and doing mm -hmm. the job. So that's kind of taken us back a notch or two. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think overall we'll We'll keep pushing forward. Mm -hmm. There's always the momentum wave behind it. It's it's like the shock wave. You have the initial explosion, and then nothing, and then the shock wave comes. Mm -hmm. Well, we're still in the shock wave. We're mm -hmm. still pushing it. So, and we're glad to have you and all the other people that come down mm -hmm. here. So, were you involved with any of the other things that have been built in the in the town here, like the the Vulcan bust, the Spock bust, the painting of the street walks, the the yeah. sidewalks, the painting of the doctor's painting? Were you involved in any of that as well? Yes, part of that was part of Vast initiative. We had a couple of artists in town. We had some provincial grants that were available, and we promoted that through chamber of commerce. Whoever else would mm -hmm. listen and say, you know, you want to put a mural on your building. It's not going to cost you a bunch. We can get a grant for it. And unfortunately, that program didn't it didn't materialize very well. One of the programs that we did, one of the initiatives, was when Leonard Nimoy was coming. Mm -hmm. uh, it was interesting because when he signed on for Calgary Comic Con, the second question he asked them was, how far is Vulcan from there? 
and I'm not signing anything until you take me to Vulcan. <laughs> <laughs> so that was pretty cool. I, so he did come. I shook his hand. We had a chat. Mm -hmm. He's a pilot. I'm a pilot. So we talked pilot stuff. We didn't talk Star Trek stuff, but so much. But uh, a real interesting, down to earth, nice guy. Uh, I've talked to many artists and authors who've come through here. Mm -hmm. um, the one, one of the art writers that came through here, the lady, I can't remember her name. I took her for an airplane ride. She came back twice. I think it was before my time. She used to sail on the Blue Nose out of Halifax. That oh, was her... Diane Carey? That could be. She was. She's big into boats. Diane Carey, she wrote a few novels. Yeah. And she writes Star Trek mm -hmm. from the boat exercise. Okay. Mm -hmm. But anyway, she really enjoyed coming out here. and So, yeah, we've had... Mm -hmm. an, the hands actually went to the Vegas convention in eleven. It was a big convention, Star mm -hmm. Trek convention. I was just flipping through some papers last night, and we had this, the bronze signs. One of our tourism coordinators had lined up a gal in the states t to do the bronze, and so we needed their handprint, and we got it all done at the convention, and then. Unfortunately, that sort of fizzled because there was a misconnect between her and our director and our changing director. So I don't know what state that program is in now, but mm -hmm. we were, that was one of the other initiatives. So yeah, you're trying to get other people's handprints into bronze is what you're trying to do? Yeah, mm -hmm. they would put it on a carbon copy and then she would do it in bronze and sip us up the actual bronze Mm -hmm. And we install it was supposed to be installed in their sidewalks. Yeah, so you're kind of doing your own Vulcan Walk of Fame kind of thing. Is yes. what you're trying to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then realized that's not very practical because we get a lot of snow and ice here, so there's <laughs> shovels and stuff going scraping over these bronze plaques. Okay. Not very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so when so when Leonard Nimoy came and he did his handprint, was that done in the same manner, or was he here when he did it, or? Um, I believe it was done like I, I wasn't privy to the actual how that happened. Mm -hmm. I um, I don't I don't know much okay, about that's that. Fine, yeah. Now you're also working on trying to you're working with Paul here to try and get this Klingon bird of prey mm -hmm. uh, built and put up. And so, do you want to talk a little bit about that and what you're doing to help out with that? <clears throat> well, um, originally the Klingon group Paul brought his 25th anniversary. Uh, yeah. K Canada to Vulcan one year from Ontario. Oh, yeah. Ontario, Halifax. Yeah. And uh, I was impressed and excited to see the influence this gentleman has. And uh, so um, from that, they sent us a letter and they wanted to name a street or something just in commemoration of the Klingon investment here. And I said, well, let's go one up on that. Why don't we? Why don't we let him build a ship? Mm -hmm. To which Paul and I talked a little bit about, and he got really excited. And, uh, there's a lot of excitement going on over it. We haven't. There's a lot of things we haven't got fine-tuned, but the idea and the concept is on fire. So mm -hmm. we had a meeting, and uh, we're going forward with it. Mm -hmm. It's the other part of the back wave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> And have you, have you had anybody say so far that there already is a Klingon ship beside the Enterprise? It's just cloaked? Yeah. <laughs> well, we had some discussion about a cloaked ship, and uh, yeah, that's part of the plan. Yeah, actually, it is part of the plan. <laughs> we, we really haven't talked a whole lot about it, but we have a great idea. Yeah. Okay, and, yeah. Uh, Anything you're able to elaborate on now, or is it yeah, sure. you have for now? So. What, what's in, it started as a joke. I mean, you know... Uh, <laughs> I think it was Star Trek uh, Four uh, when they bring the whales, the whales back to uh, yeah uh, to, uh, to, to to Earth, and I got to thinking like you could put some indents in the ground, okay, and and uh, take a garbage can and crush it, nice, okay, <laughs> and, and a plaque. Remember where you parked. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, that, that's great. That'd be funny. Yeah, I think that'd be funny. So we we added to we embellished it a little farther and putting a ladder yeah by the garbage can. Okay, but. Nothing there, just <laughs> into space, <laughs> seemingly, yeah, yeah. and therefore be a cloaked Klingon ship. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Remember where you parked. <laughs> it's like, yeah, we'll see how far that goes. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, Pat, is there any other stories about your history working with the, the Trek conventions and whatnot here in Vulcan that you want to talk about? Any really memorable stories? Anything else you want to elaborate on that I haven't had a chance to ask about? Uh, you know, every year it's always really special. Like one year I, uh, we had some skydivers that landed in the field by the Trek station, and I was the pilot that let them out to fly mm-hmm. around. That was kind of interesting. The, the most memorable Bond one is when we met Leonard mm-hmm. Nimoy and when he came here. Uh, that that was a whole event all by itself. Did you did you hear the story about Dana and, and how Leonard gave her a phone call? Oh yes, that's well. You, you told me this last. Why don't you tell me the story? This is great. Or Good. Dana was working at the track station at the time. Supergirl, she had everything together really well. And so the phone rings. She answers it. Vulcan Tourism. Hi, this is Leonard Nimoy. She goes, Yeah, right. <laughs> like we get this call every other week so what <laughs> and it really was Leonard and he says I don't approve of what Paramount has done because we had sent in and wanted to host the premiere showing of the last movie mm-hmm. and I can never remember the names of this stuff yeah, but this anyway, was a 2009 so the 2009 movie yeah, yeah. yeah it was, the, it was the, uh, the reboot the reboot yeah okay. the reboot yeah. Mm-hmm. so uh, Leonard said I don't agree with what Paramount's doing to you and so Paramount got back to us and said, well, you have no theater. Mm-hmm. We said, so? Well, you don't have this, you don't have that, and you don't have another thing. We said, so? Mm-hmm. <laughs> What's wrong with this? <laughs> so Leonard made some noise, and Paramount shipped 300 of us locals to the theater in Calgary to watch the premiere viewing of the movie. We, we had an advanced screening. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Nice, nice. And they brought in... They brought in um, uh, Greenwood, um, Bruce Greenwood, Bruce Greenwood, Bruce. Mm-hmm. and he hosted the uh, the event for us. He, you know, he nice. stood down there and he shared a little of his uh, uh, story and um, how the movie came to be and uh, his role in it and answered any question from anybody and uh, yeah, that was very memorable. Yeah, excellent. Right on. And Leonard always called Vulcan this Vulcan his home. He said when he was here, he said, you know, my hometown has changed so much. I don't recognize it anymore. But Vulcan, I consider my home. Nice. nice. I thought, what a compliment. Excellent. Well, you guys have done some great work here. I hope that the momentum continues. I hope we see some growth in here with the convention. And uh, I really wish you guys success on creating this bird of prey. I think it's going to be great. And, uh, yeah, awesome. Keep up the great work. Well, Brandon, you know this. You're always welcome to come back. I oh, yeah. hopefully hopefully want to be back next year. Yeah. Absolutely, I hope yeah. to come back. So. I'm glad you're here. It's this not year. that far. I'm from Regina, so it's not that far. We used know. to ride the Greyhound out to Regina from Calgary. That's a long way on the Greyhound. Yes, <laughs> yes. and at warp night, it's quick, right? That's so, right. Excellent. You're in a flash. <laughs> We're in the Vulcan Legion Hall, waiting the trivia event and this the welcome event. Uh, my name is Brandon Shamichella. And I'll be doing the trivia tonight, and sitting with me are four wonderful Star Trek fans. We're just going to have a little conversation before everything starts. Uh, why doesn't everybody tell me their names and where they're from? Darius, and I'm from Creston. Creston? I'm Carol, Darius's mom, and I'm from Creston as well. Andrew from Cochrane, Alberta. Genevieve from Cochrane, Alberta. So, uh, sorry, what was his name again? Andrew. Andrew, Andrew and... Genevieve. Genevieve, and Darian, and... Darius. Darius, and... Carol. Carol, okay. So now you two have been to Vulcan before. This is our ninth year. Ninth year. And you come and you meet some friends every year. And you said it was last year or a couple years ago that you got to meet your favorite Sergeant character? It was a, a few years. years ago. Two or three. Two or three years yeah. ago. So tell us about your favorite character. Favorite Neelix. actor. Ethan Phillips. I love it. You know, there's so much hate for Neelix out there and I just don't understand the hate for Neelix. He's so much fun to watch. He's my personal favorite character in Voyager. He's my favorite. So what's your favorite Neelix moment? Do you have one? Um... My favorite Neelix moment would be the when he finds out that there, or when he thinks there's no heaven, his oh, yes, yes. kind of heaven. Yeah, and he has that kind of... And kinda, he just wants to end it all. and Yeah, the crisis, because he, he dies. Mortal Coil, I think, is the name yeah. of the episode. Yeah, he dies. They bring him back to life with the, uh, the amazing dual nanoprobes, and uh, he has a crisis because he did not see the tree. Yeah. Yes, excellent, right on. Yeah, it's a great one. I love that one. So you get to meet him, and Ethan Phillips is amazing. He's absolutely phenomenal person. Excellent, right on. Hasn't let fame get to his head. 
actually that year when we came we couldn't stay in Vulcan we had to stay in High River and he was staying at the Ramada Inn and High River okay and we were in the elevator together and I poked my husband and said look 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 and he's like it's not him don't worry we come to the meet and greet and Neelix comes up to me Ethan Phillips and he's like look 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 it is me (laughs) (laughs) awesome he's a pretty funny guy yeah so what's your favorite Star Trek series uh, Deep Space Nine. Yeah, I gotta agree with that one. That's my favorite too. Why Deep Space Nine? Uh, mostly because you get to know the different species better and get to know the cultures better, and like they still go off and explore, but they always have to come back. Yeah, yeah. One of my favorite episodes is for the uniform. Oh, I nice. actually made myself two ringtones from that episode. <laughs> that's an editing Eddington, right? Eddington episode. Yeah, yeah when where they finally funny. caught him. Oh, that's such a great one. And my wife would always ask me what I would do if I ever met him in person. And I'm like, well, it would take all my energy to not punch him in the face. Yep. <laughs> and she kept asking why. So she finally watched Deep Space Nine with me. And then she's like, yeah, I kind of hate him a little too. <laughs> <laughs> hate the character, not the actor. Yes. <laughs> my favorite character in all of Star Trek is Garrick. In all of Star Trek. Really? So I just love Garrick so much. I think he's great. So what's your favorite series? Uh... Voyager. Voyager, yeah. You got a favorite character or favorite episode? Mm, I can't remember. I like the Doctor. Okay, yeah, yeah. Also Neelix. Yep. Yeah. Try to remember different episodes. I like the finale. That one's good. You like the finale, the end game? Yeah, end yeah. game. Admiral Janeway destroying the Borg mm-hmm. Queen. Yeah. It's nice to see Alice Krieg back at, as the uh, as the Borg Queen for that one. Hey. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right on. I um. I gotta ask you this question then. So, there's this thing out there in Star Trek fandom and in all fandoms in general called shipping, right? Where people want to see people get in relationships together. They fall in love on TV and stuff. Were you a Doctor and Seven shipper? Did you want to see Doctor and Seven get together? Mm, no. No? Yeah, neither did I. I didn't ship much. <laughs> so, <laughs> myself. And, Mom, are you a Star Trek fan? Oh, yeah, you bet. Yeah, so, what's your favorite series? Uh, Voyager. Voyager. Lots of Voyager represented Woo-hoo! here. Oh, boy, you don't get a lot about that. You know, that's what's great about conventions like this and sitting down with fans. You know, I'm on, uh, I'm on a lot of podcasts, and we talk with a lot of people, and people get really nitpicky. And being in social media, uh, in Star Trek fandom, you, you're exposed to a lot of negativity. You know, when you hear a lot of, oh, I don't like this, I don't like this, this is terrible, blah, 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 and people get frustrated and angry and stuff, and it's like, sometimes you just got to sit down and talk about what we love yeah. about Star Trek, and, I, and, you know, Voyager's not my favorite, but it doesn't mean I don't like it, you know, like, probably, you know, Deadlock from season two is my favorite Voyager episode, that's the one at the Herogen when the ship kind of splits in two, yeah. right, yeah. you know, like, I love that episode, that's one of, that's top five of all of Star Trek for me that episode you know so it's great to hear love for Voyager this is great so tell us your favorite character or favorite episode for Voyager I would say um, I don't know I have several favorite characters but my favorite episode is the one with the food fight with Tom Paris and Neelix and oh yes and that's where the they one. then um, take care of the little baby alien lizard creature yeah the little dinosaur I cannot remember their episode name right now so it'll probably come to me in a second but uh they uh, they're fighting over Kess, yep. so yeah, you know, they 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 get in an argument over Kess. So okay, so Voyager fans here, let me ask you this question: Being exposed to fandom, this is a topic that I've never considered. And you know, people say that they don't like the Neelix and the Kess relationship, and part of the reason they think it's gross because Kess is only two years old and whatnot. And I'm like, well, these aliens age at different rates, so this has never been a problem for me. Yes. You know, did anybody here have a problem with the Neelix and Kess no, relationship? She's an adult at one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's how I always said it. She's an adult. Well, yeah, she's fine. She's one years old, but they grow at a different rate. So, yeah. you know. But, anywho. Um, so, you're Deep Space Nine, your Voyager. My favorite is Deep Space Nine, followed closely by the original series. So, this is Deep Space Nine's 25th anniversary. Are you guys doing anything special to celebrate DS925? You gonna you watching all the episodes this year or anything like that? You gonna st- Actually, just uh, about a month ago finished. Watching through Deep Space Nine. First time or hundredth time? First time. First time. Oh boy! What do you, so? What's your first impressions on DS Nine then? How does it rank in the series orders for you? And I'd say it's just below Voyager. Okay. Yeah. Any special episodes that stand out for you? Any favorite characters? I like the one where they. What's it called? Trials and Tribulations. Nice. Where they go back in time. Yeah, that yeah. one's a lot of fun. 
that was a lot of fun. So, how about you? Anything special you do for DS925? Um, not really, no. Not really anything. So, I'm doing a, a rewatch and I'm tweeting along, uh, so I'm watch, trying to watch an episode every oh. other day. But, uh, how about you guys? Anything special? Not planned, but we could do that. <laughs> One of the things that I thought was funny is I joined a Facebook group, the Deep Space Nine Facebook group, and the, the episode Prodigal Daughter, mm-hmm. where O'Brien's supposed to be off on New Sydney. Mm-hmm in the custody of the police you actually when you have Bashir and Cisco in Cisco's office you see O'Brien walk by Cisco's office and ops nice. and they're like isn't he supposed to be in the custody of the police on another planet you got some bloopers in there but to be able to catch something like that like how slow are people watching it or how many times have they seen it before they actually noticed yes and what's everybody's impressions on Discovery so far, the new chapter in Star Trek? Honestly, I haven't gotten through it. I haven't got, I, haven't got through it yet? I got about through an episode and a half, and then I just I couldn't keep watching. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have to try and watch it again. Part of the problem was the first time they aired it, the guys from inner space were talking way too long so half the episode was them talking oh. so it started at the beginning but it cut off the rest of the episode okay i should have done the smart thing and recorded another episode after the two part uh opening okay, okay. and yeah i missed half an episode so i sort of got lost there <laughs> okay yeah, yeah, yeah. so that's probably why i haven't moved on and what do you think they totally messed it up i mean it's it's dark. It's super violent. It's uh, they don't have any humor in it. It looks now from the trailers that they're going to put humor in the second season, but mm-hmm. there is no humor. You don't learn anything personal about the characters. Like even in TOS, right in the first season, you know who Hora loves to play the harp and she speaks Swahili and she's from you know a, a warrior race, right? And you know that Sulu imagines himself descended from samurai warriors and you know how, you know, all these characters have these backgrounds and you, they don't develop any of that in the first season. Mm-hmm. It's just, I thought it was terrible. You didn't, okay, didn't like it as much? Did you watch it? Did you like it? Yeah, I liked it. You liked it a lot? What'd you, what was your favorite parts of the season? I liked uh, the episode, the second episode actually of Mud. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. They're in the time loop. The time loop, what yep. What was it called? Magic to make the sanest man yeah. go mad. Yeah, that's Check one, two, one, two, check one, two. We're going to test in some audio check here. Check one, two, one, two, check one, two. Yes, so we've got Discovery Season 2 coming out. Have you guys all you've seen the trailer? You're excited for it? Yeah, I think it looks pretty good. It looks I'm like they're excited. going to improve it. They're adding some humor, Check some one, lightness the there, so it should one, be two, a lot better. Two. Excellent, cool, check right one, on. Two, my check one, one, two. I can edit it out, it's no worse. <laughs> Just cut it out, it's no big deal. So, um, okay, what else should I ask here? What are you guys looking forward to most this weekend here at Vulcan? <laughs> The reunion with our friends that we see here every year for the last nine years. Excellent. Yeah, right on. You got a big group of friends, just a couple of close ones? Well, we got a big group, but a lot of them are about gone half of them have gone to the big one in Vegas. Mm-hmm. So yeah. they're in Seattle right now. Okay, they're in Seattle right now. So yeah. they're heading down towards Vegas. So Yeah, right on. What are you guys looking forward to most? Now, this is your first convention, isn't it? Yeah. What are you looking forward to most? Um... I don't know, really. Not quite sure? You're just here to check out the events? Mm-hmm. You're going to be dressing up tomorrow? Mm-hmm. Yeah, ask some questions. Sure. Are you going to dress up tomorrow? you got some cosplay going on? No, I, I had this old uniform that my mom made me, but it's too small now. So. Yeah, you're growing like a weed? <laughs> oh, yeah. Excellent. And this, is this your first convention, too, then? Yep, yeah, yeah. Right but on. I'm looking forward to talking to, hopefully, interacting a bit with the special guests that have started on Star Trek and asking some questions. Excellent. Right on. Well, thank you guys very much for taking some time to talk with me and uh, tell, talking a little bit about Star Trek, telling our love of Voyager, because it is a great show, and uh, Neelix is the best character, hands down. Give me a high five. I love it. Yes, thanks, guys. Right on.
I hope you've been enjoying the podcast so far. We've got one more presentation for you, and it's a little bit longer, so I just wanted to introduce it to you. Uh, one of the really cool things that they had at the Vulcan convention was they had a meet and greet, which was on the very first night, on the Friday. And what the meet and greet was, was they had a bunch of tables set up, but they had some nice sandwiches for us, some, some finger food, some vegetables and things like that. Uh, but at the front table they had the three celebrity guests. And there was Tucker Smallwood, who was on Enterprise. He played one of the Zindi, and we interviewed him. Uh, I believe it was episode 106 that we interviewed him on Warp 5. Jennifer Gotti, who played uh, Libby on Star Trek Voyager and the Klingon Romulan Bael in Birthright. And from the Star Trek Discovery show. We had Rekha Sharma as well. So what I've recorded is their meet and greet panel. And so it's, it's in an audience that's a little bit of a, a loud room as well. And the, so the audio might be a little bit bad. Um, there are some people who kind of come drift to and fro from the microphone a little bit. Uh, but I, I think if you listen, you'll still enjoy the discussion they had. There's some great questions with the fans. Uh, the fans got to act one on, interact one-on-one -on -one with the celebrities on stage. So it was pretty darn cool. And honestly, I think it was the best. It was, it was my favorite part of the convention that I got to go in and listen to this and see this really cool interactive panel that they had. So I hope you enjoy it. And I hope you've enjoyed this coverage of Vulcan 2018. And I hope to come back next year. So this has been a little supplemental episode of Warp 5. Not all about Star Trek Enterprise, but a little bit. So uh, live long and prosper. Um, thank you for all being here tonight and giving us such a warm welcome. I have our beverages now. Yes, so. we're good. We're, we're, we're very relaxed. Kapla! Kapla. Oh, Kapla, that's right. I'm sorry, I'm rusty. I'm so rusty. Please, all I can say is just please forgive me. <laughs> so, um, so where are all of you from? Some of you. What, what part of all together? Yeah, all at once. Okay, how about this? Don't be shocked. Who isn't from Vulcan? Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Nobody lives in Vulcan. Wow. Wow. I thought this town would have been taken over by all of you. <laughs> Only once a year, right? Um, oh, I got a good one. How many of you are here for the first time? Oh, wow. I was going to say quite a few here for the first time. And how many of you come here like every year? Yeah. <laughs> Committed. <laughs> That's right. Nine years. Nine years. And where are you? Where are you from? Concord, Alberta. Okay. Red Alberta. Okay. Wow. So, how many of you are from Alberta? Okay. Wow. Oh, that's quite a few. So, is anyone here not from Canada? Oh, wow. So, where are you from? Montana. Okay. Okay. Well, all of y'all. You're all. All y'all? All y'all? That's where I live now. I live in the south in the United States. I live in the southeast, so we say y'all. All y'all. <laughs> so did you drive here? How long is it? I don't know. They probably stick around. You know, that's one of the few states I still have. I still have not been to Montana. I, it's one of the few states I, I just would love to go. It's just so beautiful. But it's kind of like, is it like this? It's the big sky and... We live in the mountains. Do you live in the mountains? So you're in the mountains? Okay. I live in a smaller town south of Okay. Okay. Wow. Right off the Canyon Ferry Lake and all of the mountains. Wow. Oh, wow. That sounds like I'm sold. I know. It sounds wonderful. It's beautiful here, though, I have to say. I, I act, yeah. I live in the mountains now, too. Um, I, I grew up in New York City. And I lived in Los Angeles, like both of these folks do. I lived in LA for many years. But then I moved to, I decided to leave LA and move to a, a state in called North Carolina. And in North Carolina, there's the Blue Ridge Mountain, and there's a city there called Asheville, little little city, and uh, it's it's gorgeous. So I, but I'm just I'm in, you know, it's just mountains everywhere. It's just mountains. And so to be here is just amazing. To see the plains and the sky, it's just it's incredible. You know, it's a really beautiful. It's like you can drive and not get lost because you can always see where you need to go. <laughs>
or you can get totally lost because everything looks the same. <laughs> I appreciate you guys all coming here to listen to us ramble. <laughs> yeah, meet us and greet us. Yeah. Meet and greet. You guys get an A plus on the meeting know. and the greeting. Meeting and greeting. Yeah, the, the, the test is at the end of the convention when you're all exhausted. Yeah, and thank you for not doing this in the winter time. Yes, yes, it's beautiful right now. Yes, I am a wuss and I can't. I mean, I grew up in the Northeast with winters, but then when I moved to California, my blood thinned, and I've never recovered. I cannot, if it's 50 degrees, I'm freezing. Yeah. So. I, I've had thin blood my entire life, and I was born and raised in Vancouver. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I just moved to LA three years ago, and LA is an interesting place, but it's warm. <laughs> It's just another beautiful day in Southern California. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what we always used to say. It's like, oh, it's like another beautiful day. <laughs> yeah, it almost strangles you with its sun sunniness. I was so happy to have that storm yesterday yes. here. Yes. Wasn't that incredible? Yeah. I mean, I, well, maybe not well, for you, but for us. Not in a trailer. Yeah. 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 Yeah, to show up in the hotel and, uh, you know, no t I was really excited to watch Canadian TV and then I had no TV or internet to pick up the thunderstorm, so I was like, oh, I was just waiting to watch Canadian television. <laughs> I had to wait till three in the morning, my TV. Well, I guess I left it on and didn't realize oh, at three o'clock in the morning. Like, yeah, it was like, boom! It was just like, hey, mom. Oh. So we, I guess we're here, if you guys, I know that there's Q&As and stuff all weekend, but um, don't be shy if you guys want to ask questions or yeah. chit chat or I am willing to give up this mic Yeah, and we can share the one. Yeah. <laughs> Do you guys want to ask us any questions? If they have to mold your face and your head, because you, they literally stick everything in, in in a cast to create to create the forehead, to create the nose. So there was the molding of my face. There was the wig maker, Renata, who also does all the wigs for Cher. So the woman who does Cher was wigs did my hair uh, for for Vale. Um, there was the Klingon lessons, which was incredible to learn from the man who created Klingon. Last year. Yeah, last year. Was it? Yes, that's yeah. right. That's right. James told me. And so, um, um, and so that was, you know, so those, those are my great moments. The preparation for being Klingon, having to learn Klingon, having to pre-record the song, 
having to the costuming. It was just such an amazing experience because I was such a fan of the show to begin with, and then to just and just to just to wander through the Paramount lot and and, and look at the sets, you know, to be a part of it. So yeah, I was I completely geeked out the entire time I got on that show. So Thank, thank you for talking, because you got my, my juices flowing. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've watched TOS when I was in elementary school. And my brother introduced me to it, big, big brother. So I would come home, literally eat cookies and milk and watch TOS. So to find out that I was going to be actually on Discovery was, I screamed like a little girl with delay. Yeah, and so every part of it was so exciting. The costumes were, are incredible that they have on Discovery, and um, I didn't have to get molded at the beginning, but I did get molded. Uh, has everybody watched Discovery? Am I going to be in spoiler bill here? Everybody watched it? Okay, good. So, when the tardigrade ripped me to shreds, um, <laughs> Uh, there was a lot of special effects makeup that had to go into that, and so I too had a complete cast over my entire face. And I gotta say, I'm really sorry. I was felt terrible to the makeup artists, but they said my reaction was one of the better reactions. So there's two reactions. Either people freak out and get claustrophobic, very anxious, or they fall asleep. I mean, we shot a lot of long hours for Star Trek. It was the best nap of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, oh, such a warm, cozy. Oh. And then I tried to stay awake for a while, and then when they took it off, then I knew I had failed because I didn't remember doing this anymore. I was like, I fell asleep and I, they were like, it's good, it's good, it's fine, it's fine, we just held your head. I was like, oh, that's why I couldn't sleep, because I didn't have to do that anymore, they actually helped me. That
the, um, the makeup process for me in, as a Zindi was two hours of application in the morning and an hour and a half at night. And, and it was pretty much can't see in the morning till can't see at night. Um, so those were long days. Um, but Enterprise was rather unique as a Trek series in that there was no Bible for the Zendi. There was a Bible for the Romulans. There was a Bible for the Klingons. They was established. These are your burial rituals. These are your wedding rituals. These are your courting rituals. This is your language. There was no Bible for the Zindi. And so the five of us got to create them. Now that's pretty dumb. And Trek is very, and has always been, very, we don't bring you here to improvise. We will tell you what to say. So if you want to change an uh to the, you will bloody well get permission before you do it. I'm serious. They take it seriously, and I respected that. Um, but we would sit there in these long days, 15, 16 hour days, in the makeup and on the set and in our costumes as they set up. And there's Zindi, if you remember, there are six of us. Now who knows what the six Zindi species are? Go! Insectoids, reptilians, avians, uh, arboreals, aquatics, and primates. That's correct. And which one is escape? The bird ones. Aliens. <laughs> the aliens, very good. Uh, so Scott and I and uh, Rick uh, and Randy would sit around and we would make up our rituals, our courting rituals, our burial rituals, and I'm going to find a way to PG this. Uh, <laughs> Scott McDonald played the reptilian, and the reptilian uh, was uh, uh, hermaphrodite. And so there were times on the set when I would say to Scott, why don't you go? And the truth of it was, you actually could. <laughs> now, is that a punchline or what? Well, Talker. Um, so the question was, has anybody else in the Star Trek universe died twice? Word on the street is, they have died twice, but I am the first security officer to die twice in, uh, I'm the only person to die that uh, close together. That's what it is. I wish I had a cooler way of saying that. <laughs> I have to find that tweet from the person who wrote it down for me and then I'll, I'll recite it. Thank you. Yes, and uh, oh, possibly the only person to have died in two universes. Same character, two universes. I do a lot of dying. It's going to be interesting when I actually die. I wonder what that is. Oh, bless you. So did I. <laughs> that as an idea. <laughs> they laughed. Hopefully they'll do more than that. It's like, just, yeah, bring me back every episode. You. You killed Landry. Again. So I have a question for you guys. If no one else has a, does anybody else have a question right now? Oh, okay. Right, right, right. Now that's cool. So, I mean, I could ask this question when everybody else is there too, but Town of Vulcan, I want to know more. Inquiring minds want to know. Uh, how did, does anybody know why Star Trek decided to name their people after this place? Or, like, what is the connection? I know, I know. 
So I did my studying on Vulcan. I was fascinated by it. And so I know, so the town was named after the god of fire. Vulcan is the god of fire. And I guess, it, and I think you have street signs that also relate to the god of fire. Or, or, Greek, that's it, Greek mythology. And then, and then I got into the whole like grains and granaries and all that stuff, which was really interesting. So, um, so that's my sort of peripheral. All of you feel free to please, you know, add the, the words. But that's what it is. So cool. So, so then the Romulans. Were they into the god of fire, and then the Vulcans were like, well, the, were they Vulcans yet? Oh, that's so confusing. <laughs> Do you follow what I'm saying? Or, or uh, sorry, is it Romulans or Andorians? Which which ones are the ones that are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had it right. Romulans are the ones who became Vulcans. <laughs> what? <laughs> Other way around. <laughs> no, but. Okay, I thought, where am I getting my information? <laughs> Maybe I just made this up in my head. I thought that everybody was Romulan, and you know, the Romulans, they're pretty, it was the other way. Yeah. So everybody was Vulcan and very logical, and then the Romulans yeah. were like, hell with that. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna be bad at stuff. That's it? They became the, the, the two different races because they had a common ancestor. But, um, yeah, they started as Vulcans, but they didn't want to suppress their emotions. Yes. They broke off, started their own culture. So they okay. still have a common ancestry, but they're two different races. They became two different races, but at one time they were actually the same one, right? Yeah. I see. I thought it was the other way around. I thought they were all fiery and passionate. And then they were, and then they were destroying their own culture. So when I, yeah, when they were taught to suppress their emotions. To, to okay, so I did have it right. <laughs> the Vulcans were all like, yeah, and they they had to get their own name. Well, that's not very nice that they had to find a new name. <laughs> Who gives the Vulcans the right to take my name? I'll just cross the streams there for a second. Reka's right from a certain point of view. Oh. Wow. Like it? Like it? Go on. I'm intrigued. I have the mic. I just wanted to say she's partially right. Yeah, they were, they were passionate at first which is how the Romulans ended up becoming that, because they did not want to follow Sarek. So they decided to leave their planet and say, to heck with this, we're gonna go off and do our own thing. So they did all start off as passion, but not always destroyed themselves. Right. Sarek came in and taught the teachings. And, uh, yeah. So it's almost in a way, Romulans just went back to the Vulcan religion. They went back yeah. to their roots. Got it. Their roots. It's yeah. sort of like when you have mental illness, but you don't want to take your meds. <laughs> And you're like, no, I can't feel anything. This is terrible. It's a real thing. I'm not speaking. <laughs> They're all like, oh, the people are going to start tweeting. Vega Sharma is bipolar. She's not taking her meds. We saw her. Uh, anyway, awkward. Carrie. Yes, sir. Any of you have a favorite Any of you have a favorite Star Trek character? I, I, I mean, as a kid, I loved Spock. So I have to always say that that's my answer. But then, as I got older, you know, then he, there's so many people to love. And especially Uhura was a big one for me. Yeah. That's, that's, you know, that's really tough. Um, because I watched the original show and I watched Next Generation. I mean, I watched all of them pretty much up until, um, and then I just got really busy. And I got fine. Well, I'm sorry. And, and I, you know, it's my, sorry. But, um, <laughs> uh, I, wow. I, um, I, I sort of had a, a, an affinity for um, Picard. I just, I just love Captain Picard. So, so, um, 
mean, I, Spock, yeah, I mean, I could, that, the whole original show, you know, hands down, like, to me, like, that was like, you know, um, but um, I don't know, I just love Picard. And it, to me, he could talk, to, he could just read the phone book. And, <laughs> that's kind of like, and I, you know, and I, I didn't get to work with him, but I got to meet him. You know, so what was nice is, you know, my storyline wasn't with, with um, Patrick Stewart, but he, um, you know, you, you're all working the same day, and you know, you're in different scenes. And, you know, Jonathan Frakes was like boisterous and just, God, he's just such a nice man. And, and, um, and Patrick Stewart, I was intimidated, just, but, but boy, he, Patrick Stewart just sort of, you know, uh, he's such a friendly, flirty, he's a flirty guy. <laughs> in, a, in a really nice way. It's just like, anyway, so it was just, it was not in a creepy way, but in a really nice way. So, <laughs> so anyway, so I just, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, so I would say the car. <laughs> Yeah, but she's blushing. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> My face will uncontrollably change its color. Great. Chameleon, actress, yeah, isn't she amazing? I mean, everybody, I'm a huge Patrick Stewart fan, so I, I, I yeah, Picard is definitely in there. And I got to meet him too, and I concur, he's just so friendly and lovely and flirty and, and uh, really fun. Um, but I, I just remembered, I had, you know, when Next Gen came around, I had a total, like, Q crush. I loved Q, and it wasn't like a romantic kind of crush, it was like, an acting crush. I was like, you is the coolest. When is he coming back? And I have to say now, my life is so amazing. It's come full circle. Because now, I hang out with John Delancey. I just love that. I love that, you know, I could watch something and like, now I go to these conventions and I hang out with these people and have dinner with them and all of these people, I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing. And so, you know what? Actually, thank you guys. Because without you guys, we wouldn't have conventions. And without conventions, we wouldn't get to hang out with each other and meet all of you wonderful people. So thank you. I think my favorite Trek character, the one of which I seem to be most drawn to, or find most resonant, is Susie Blackson. Uh, she's just a, a very, very unique woman, and a wonderful, creative, earthy energy. And uh, I get, uh, but then perhaps that's because I, I've, I've spent some time with her as a human being. But um, I think the character that she plays is the one that I find most, I don't know the name of the character. You know Susie Blackson's song? Now, I was in Vancouver years ago, and I got, I was shooting the X-Files, and I got to the elevator, and on the next floor, in walked Patrick Stewart, and we faced each other, and we smiled at each other, and we nodded, and I said to him, from my superior height, <laughs> you are a captain, I am a Commodore. <laughs> Patrick Stewart flirt with you too? <laughs> <laughs> you know me too. So. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys know Patrick Stewart signed five episodes? No, I did not know that. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. This, uh, what's your name, love? Jillian. Jillian just said that Patrick Stewart is signed to do five episodes of Discovery. That's exciting. You know what I want to know? 
Who's going to play Spock? I know. Did you guys hear about this? Yeah. Spock is going to be in Discovery. Yeah. Yeah. So it's going to be younger Spock. I don't know, but I just mean a younger chronologically because this is pre-Enterprise. Yeah, they just met the end. So we met Pike. We all know Anson Mount is playing Pike, which is amazing. And he seems so wonderful. I'm really looking forward to meeting him. Um, but Spock. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would be Spock. <laughs> totally. Spock X. <laughs> exactly. I mean, yeah. Michael's, you know, half sister. I could be a half something. <laughs> this conversation is really plummeting. <laughs> Any of you ever found that your characters you previously played bleed through to your new characters? <laughs> okay, we're talking. I feel like a Cylon right now. <laughs> I think if a woman is sensual and earthy and sexy, that quality will continue to accompany future incarnations of people. Thank you. By the same token, if I am playing a naval commodore, which is a, a flag rank and one star admiral, and I suddenly find myself playing a two-star general or the head of the CIA or whatnot, there will be certain qualities that will be common to all of those characters. But they are qualities. They are not necessarily idiosyncrasies or characteristics or personality quirks. That's the difference. <laughs> What was interesting is I did um, Next Generation first, and then a couple of years later, I did the episode of Voyager, where I was um, Libby, and Ensign Kim's fiance. And so, you know, I went from being Worf's girlfriend to Ensign Kim's girlfriend. And I, and I think the, you know, even though I was a Klingon, I was half Romulan, and I think the whole point of that was there was a softness to Baal that, that Worf, you know, so the whole, the whole thing about the objective of Baal, according to Rick Berman, was they wanted to create what they thought was the first attractive Klingon. You know, and I would say, well, maybe some people already think Klingons are attractive. But I guess, you know, they wanted, I think what he meant is they wanted to make her softer and, um, and more uh, wide-eyed and, and uh, innocent. And so I think that's the, the, the Romulan Klingon, um, you know, the, the combination of both is kind of, you know, so she, she she could be tough, but she also had the softness to her. And I think, and I think then when I came back to do Libby, it was a sim it was similar. So it did lead to that because Libby is a character where nothing has changed. You know, her her fiance has never left. And, you know, he's leaving, and so there's this combination where she has this toughness of like, I don't want you to leave, but then the vulnerability of you have to leave. So it's like. It's sort of interesting, both, both of my characters ended up getting left by the man that they love. Um, and, and so it's interesting, there is sort of a, I couldn't help, I guess, but take some of what was happening with Baal and Borg and ended up kind of being the same situation with, with, with Libby and, and, and with him. So it did sort of bleed into each other. And I think so too, I think the creators, you know, the producers of the show, they, as they think of you when you're an actor and you do a character, they kind of have an idea of who you are based on what you play. I think that's sort of why I played another character kind of similar. I played like almost the human version of Baal. Now that, you know, that's sort of, now that I think about that, that's sort of what happens. So, yeah, I think it does really Because part of who you are too as a person, I think, every character that you play also. That's a long answer. <laughs> 
I got a question right here. Where are you? I am right over here. Hello. Hello. So, out of all of the Star Trek series, who are some of your least favorite characters? Uh oh. Oh, no, no, no. It's also like on the internet. I know. I know. I don't want to touch Oh, water. Well, let's, I mean, let's talk about Lorca for a second here. <laughs> I, I owe my demise to Lorca. Twice. Twice. Backstabbing. Oh, 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 oh. How many of you feel the same way? A few of you. Thanks, thanks. He's very charming, though, isn't he? And handsome. Um, but yeah, that's all I have to say. Gardens, and it's um, about 10 minutes from my home in the Valley. It's a very otherworldly place. It's gorgeous, and it's very unique. I filmed three projects there, and Voyager was one of them, and Biodome was another. Um, and I remember working, uh, it's Ethan, right? It's Ethan. And, you know, I mean, I meant nothing personal between he and I as, as people, but as characters something that just got on my nerves about it. And as I recall, I um, was addressing one of my subordinates and, and saying to him, yes, you take uh, these people in Nelix uh, somewhere else. And he corrected me, Nelix. And I looked at him and said, whatever. <laughs> and he went, <laughs> perfect. to play the different versions of Landry because they were very similarly portrayed. And I just wonder if you shed some light on that. Yeah. Um, what can I say about this? Um, it, they were written quite similarly. And um, it, so it was a challenge to find how they were different. And honestly, there was so much going on on set, um, I didn't want to bother anybody. So, <laughs> so um, we didn't really address it until just before we started shooting my scene, my first scene. And then we, we literally found it as we were going. Because she wasn't written in a particular, you know, she wasn't like Captain Killy or anything, like drastic opposite. Um, it really became a subtle subtlety that I found um, with the help of uh, Ted and Olatunde. We kind of found a world where it really, for me, became about the difference between being the one who's in charge and responsible for an entire crew's safety to being the underdog, being an oppressed person who is fighting for freedom. 
and still, you know, a lot of badass skills. Otherwise, she wouldn't have been Lorca's right hand gal in both universes. But yeah, I actually enjoyed pro uh, Mirror Landry better, and I felt that Mirror Landry was much more vulnerable. And uh, and yeah, that's that's probably all I want to say. <laughs> Oh yeah, sorry. That question was for me. Um, I, I have, I'm gonna veer yes. slightly off the Star Trek realm and move totally. into the space above and beyond realm because I am still to this day a huge fan and I, I'm very angry that it was canceled, but that's beside the point. Um, no. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I can't. Um, I still, every Christmas, watch A River of Stars because it's the Christmas episode and you have to. I was wondering if, for Tucker, if the you playing and singing, was that actually scripted or was that something that you wanted to do? Because one of my favorite parts, because I can quote that episode from start to finish. <laughs> It, um, it's probably the most personally meaningful character that I've played in 47 years because he was essentially me 25 years after Vietnam. The same values, the same commitment to his people and to the mission, and the same concern for the well-being of his subordinates. And I loved that Jim and Glenn respected what these men do and women do that much. And through those years, in those mid-90s, I would, I traveled a lot doing other projects and whatnot. And in those days, there were recruitment stations in airports and they had glass walls. And I would, well, this happened on three or four times over the years. I would be walking through an airport and someone in uniform would come running out of this office and run up and catch me and say, I watch that show every week. I make sure my son watches that show. And it's hard for me to express what that means to you as an artist. Um, that's, that's about the highest kind of affirmation you can get. Um, Jen and Glenn gave me a platform and they trusted me to further and fulfill their vision. There was a day when I got a script and Ross is sitting in his cabin drinking single malt scotch. And at that time, I really didn't drink single malt scotch. I have learned since then. <laughs> but I, um, I, I sent an email, and that was new to me too, because I'd only been online for about six months. I remember they came to me and said, you got like 500 fan letters, where? On the internet. <laughs> well, well, how do I get them? <laughs> you have to sign on. So I hear the world gave us all the canvas. And, Oh, fart that I am, I still have an AOL account. I'm, I'm loyal, shoot, I'm loyal. So I got my script and I'm reading through it and he's drinking single malt. And I sent back an email and said, you know, I drink rum. I've been drinking rum since I was in college and uh, sailors of old drank grog, which is how they kept, you know, something potable and was watered down rum. And I, I played Delta Blues and um, about an hour and a half later, a messenger wrote me a script, and it was Ross Sainting's cabin, drinking rum and playing Delta Blues. So the Jim and Gwen said, we want, you to, we want you to sing a Christmas carol to your guys because they're lost out there, and we don't know if they're okay, but we want them to know if they can hear you that you're thinking about them. And we want you to sing <laughs> in blues. And I said, what? <laughs> I thought that was the damnedest thing I'd ever heard. But I thought about it for a while, and I said, well, why the hell not? And uh, we recorded it, and I did a version of, um, a very uncharacteristic version of I'll Be Home for Christmas. Uh, I don't know if, I don't know if it's still in me. We can find out if you want to. <laughs>
portray emotions that run so deep. And you go back into uniform and recapture some of the same stuff that used to happen to you. As a veteran, I mean, you, you, technically you died, you got resurrected by a great doctor. And then you played uh, powerful captains and powerful leaders in uniform. How do you how do you separate the real world from the experience and not end up doing a quick dip back into post traumatic stress disorder? Well, that's that's a question of technique. Um, I always love my teachers happen to be have been the three. Deities of Stanislavski, Sanford, Meisner, Stella Adler, and Lee Strasberg. Now, Lee didn't care where you got it as long as you had it. And that made for some very interesting work and some very neurotic people. And Stella and Sandy taught me to create from my imagination so that whatever I did was authentic to me but I wasn't re-traumatizing myself. Uh, when Francis I met with for a couple of hours in the early, mid 70s, for Apocalypse, and we talked about, the, I told him I was the only man at water speed in the combat zone and got shot at pretty much every time, but it was fun. And um, Stella said, you can't do that movie, you mustn't do that movie. You will come completely undone. And she knew me better than I knew myself. She knew I had her heel. She knew I was still broken. And she was right. Um, so you learn to create a character and you learn to create memories. And I can take this camera and I can endow it as a gift from my father or from my late wife. And I can make it very personal to me. And simply by touching it or turning it on, it will affect me emotionally. It will touch me. That's just technique. But it's imaginary. And when the day is done and they say wrap and go home, I'm not going to go home and, 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 and continue to break down. I'm fresh. But someone who's used a trauma from their own life, from their childhood, from an assault, from an accident, from a tragedy, who uses that to generate emotion on film or on stage, and then has to go home and live with that after the curtain has fallen or the crew has gone home, is going to have a very difficult life. Um, so they're all gone now. I'm not worried about defending anyone. Uh, I value them all, but you know, Kazan and Lee would take, I mean, Andy Griffith was brilliant in the face of the crowd, but Andy Griffith didn't do dramatic work for like 20 years after that. He was a wonderful comedic actor, but A Face in the Crowd is a very, very powerful film, and one day you should watch it. Um, so the answer, short answer to your question is, I was blessed to have been trained by people who loved me and were very generous to me, and I was able to take it in, and um, there are aspects of my life I can healthily, safely, responsibly use. But um, I know better than the trigger myself because it's not going to be reliable or dependable, certainly not on stage eight times a week and probably not safely on film, um, which is maybe why I'm still here because of all that I've gone through in my life as a man and as an artist, I was trained by people who cared about me enough to teach me to be responsible with my life. is for Jennifer. You were on a very famous, pivotal episode of NCIS. Oh, wow. It set the stage for major stuff in the next five seasons. I just wonder if you could talk for a minute about being on the set and what you thought of that episode. Um, well, thank you for, for watching that show. That episode was um, I have to say, and, and I, I'm so glad you asked this, Mark Harmon is 
one of the most wonderful actors you could absolutely work with. Um, I just, so, you know, I, I was a negotiator, you know, negotiator Arkin, and um, I worked a couple of days on the show, and, you know, and, and when you work on a, when you are a, a guest on a, on a series, and a series like that, where everybody is family, they know each other, and, and so you're an actor, and you come in, and you work a couple of days, you know, you expect a certain level of professionalism, but you don't expect the actors to become your friend. I mean, they just don't have the time to do that because they're busy and I'm gonna be one of many actors that will come in throughout the years. Mark Harmon is the exception to that. Mark Harmon treated everybody as if you were his, his best friend or his family. I mean, he just, you know, it, it really, the tone of the show starts at the top down and you know, he was kind of at the top, and his, it was long hours, yeah. it was a very grueling schedule, he would drive home many, many miles to get home to his wife late at night, you know, and, and he just, he was just really kind of this special guy, and so, um, to, to work on that show with him, and, and with the cast, Michael Webb, they're all lovely people, he really set the tone, and he was just such a giving actor, and, um, and, and you know, and, and the one memory I have is he was so pleasant, and I didn't even really work with him. He just, the fact that I was just working on the show, he wanted me to be comfortable and everything. Um, one memory I have is I'm about to go on set, you know, it's my turn, like they called me, I have to go up and shoot my scene. And I'm in military, I'm in a military garb, and he comes walking in, he just happens to see me, and he says, oh no, he says, your shoes are tied all wrong. He said, that's not the proper, way that this particular, they, they wouldn't tie their shoes this way, and I, you know, and, and I went, oh, and he proceeds to kneel down, and he starts untying my shoes, to retie my shoes correctly, and all I can think of is, I am going to get fired, because Mark Harmon is on his knees, retying my shoes for me, and and I'm just like, you know, and he just gets up, and I mean, it's all with a smile, he says, okay, yeah, that's much better, he's like, okay, great, <laughs> and he says, go ahead. And, and I asked someone, I said, I turned and, and someone in work was like, that's just Mark, that's just what he does. And I'm like, okay. And, um, and it was just such a wonderful experience. And when I finished shooting that episode, I, I said to him, I said, you know what? I said, I have to tell you, I've, I've, I've worked a long time. I've worked with a lot of great people. You're just like, you're like in a separate class. I said, I, I just, I, I can't appreciate enough how comfortable you made me feel and, and what you're like. And what he said to me, he says, all I ask you to do, he says, you pay it forward. He says, you pass it down. And I said, okay, I will. And so, yeah, so um, that was my experience working on the show. It was incredible. So that's a great show. Everybody should watch it. <laughs> express that that articulately as you just did. Mark Harmon is a very special guy, and it comes from the top. The people at the top of the show set the tone for the show, and there are a handful of special people like Mark, like Scott Bakula, like Kelsey Grammer, that make you feel part of a family. It's, it's, it's so unique, that's why it's so special, because it's so uncharacteristic of shooting, uh, I'm not going to badmouth any shows, I've done a lot of shows, nice people, but when, when you were treated as a, as a member of a family, it's, it's theatrical, we are a troop, we are all peers, yes some of us make a billion dollars a year, but that's not important, we are co-equals, are created with, and you feel that, and it's a really special feeling that, I, I mean, um, I'm, I'm very grateful for it, and just as you said, you pay it forward. Any show that I've been a regular on, I make sure my guest artists know that you've come here to make our work better. We value you. Be comfortable. Ask for what you need. It will be given. And when you don't get that love, when you don't get that understanding or that compassion, you feel totally different. If you're a pro, you're going to do your work. and You'll do it as well as you can. But it's an apples and oranges. Mark is certainly one such person. I, I have to add to it while we're talking about wonderful people. I don't know if any of you are Battlestar Galactica fans. 
But yeah, to talk about family, I mean, and top down, I've been saying this for years. Ron Moore is a beautiful human being, and he picked a troop of people that are my family to this day. And Edward James Almost is, is also one of those people. He set the tone for all the actors on the show, and he's like, he's my uncle. This, he took totally his family. It's amazing. And I will also say that on Discovery, there are wonderful people in that cast. And Sinequa Martin Green is one of the most beautiful human beings, and I can't wait for you to all meet her. And we're in a room full of people with love, because I have never been to a convention where there aren't a room full of people with love. I find people who go to conventions, sci-fi conventions, are some of the most beautiful people in the world, and I, this is what I've chalked it up to. We're all here because we dream about a better world. And that's why we like Star Trek. Right? So, in this moment of top down, remember that you all, we all have the power to make the places that we work in, live in, all of our interactions to be that sweet. Because just one person has to start it. And I'm sure you guys do that every day, and for the days where you forget, this is your reminder. <laughs> and my reminder to myself. Yeah. Because you have the power to do it. That hat is amazing. <laughs> Right? Whoopi. She's wonderful, speaking of wonderful people. Should we, should we end there? Is that more. like a good place to stop? Or you one more? Wonderful. Greca, this is for you. Um, ESG, your character. Shh. <laughs> 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 Being in that crowd that Ron Moore brought together, the character that you played, when you realized who you were, what did you draw to bring that out? You want the secrets now? This is for me and great. Okay. Um, all those poor people tomorrow that will have no idea what we said tonight. Uh, we'll bring it back up. We'll bring it back up. Uh, well, uh, who knows if anybody else wants to hear. But um, what did I draw upon? I I actually drew upon nature. This is crazy that you're asking this because I spoke about this for the very first time this year at FedCon in Germany. I have never shared this stuff with anybody, but there I was at the Battlestar Galactica reunion with like the entire cast on the stage, and I revealed that I, I thought about an owl. Not because your head just turns like this. <laughs> but there was something that, yeah. Uh, there's something about this idea that we had about other in the world of the enemy. Do you follow what I'm saying? You know, we think of the enemy as other, but we don't do that with nature. And I feel what I loved about Battlestar Galactica is it, it didn't allow you to stay in the other enemy world. It said, no, th there is no difference between, you know, we're, we're all one family, one world, one species, and we can't point the finger and say, you're evil, or you should die, right? This is, this is, we dehumanize, and that's what creates war. So I love that the show addressed that. And for me, one thing I thought about is, we don't, we don't do that with nature. We don't fault the lion for eating what it needs to eat. 
And for whatever reason, an owl came to mind when I thought about Tori and this transformation. And I thought, you know what? She just does what she needs to do because that is her nature. And we can't fault her for that. But there is a certain perceived coldness that can happen, but it's not. It's just hungry. It's just preserving its life and its family. I thought of her also like a wolf. She was very loyal to her newfound family. Yeah. You're welcome. really like deep discussions tonight guys right everybody here has spoken so beautifully about our craft as an actor and this is really rare I mean you know I, this is our first time but we don't usually have these kinds of conversations at all conventions so thank you for going there with us rather than a corporate convention I don't know, but I think that's a little bit of Good morning.